Good evening and welcome to tonight's session, Tears in the Fabric, Mending Family Relationships. For those of you who are good at convention veterans, Tears in the Fabric, Mending Family Relationships is an uncommon topic. It's not something that's come up to my knowledge before, but it started to become a topic in the firm media and it is something that would be tremendously beneficial to address. It's our hope that bringing this and bringing some awareness to this topic can create an atmosphere of reconciliation in family relationships. So what is parental alienation altogether? Parental alienation refers to situations where a parent alienates their child to the other parent. So the parent is known as the programmer or the alienator and creates a rift in the relationship with their child and the parent. Unfortunately, studies have shown that in families with divorce, there can be up to 15% of those families may suffer from a case of parental alienation. And the long-term effects on the children are dramatic. Children with parental alienation are at a tremendously higher risk to suffer from depression, to suffer from low self-esteem, and to be at higher risk for addiction. So it is something that is, is, is highly significant. Even more so, a shocking study in 2010 found that 50% of children who suffered from parental alienation as, as kids ultimately were alienated from their children. And parental alienation is a spectrum. It can be not just children, but it can be between children and their parents, children and grandparents, etc. So as in everything in Kali Yisrael, we have an opportunity tonight to hear from one of our Rabbanim and a clinical psychologist, Dr. Norman Blumenthal and Ramesha Tovia Lishlita, who will help us and give us critical guidance on these topics and issues. Ramesha Tovia Leaf is the Rav of Good Yisrael Yisrael, Beis Binyamin in Flatbush. He was also the former Rav of Beis Yisrael in Minneapolis for 19 years, and he's a sought-after speaker and someone who many families and mishpachas turn to for guidance, hadracha, chizik. It's a great honor and a tremendous covet to call upon Ramesha Tovia Leaf Shlita. Achai v'reyai, when Yedidi v'chavivi arav v'leibish beka called me about participating in the Aguda Convention. So I figured I fit into every slot. Recovering from COVID, I ate this yon yom kip, I got plasma. I met Yedidi arav Rav Yankov Bender Shlita last week. He said, Mashtuvi, I daven for you. I said, that's why I'm alive. So I have a lot to say about that, Palsha. And I have a chorus at Toiv to call Yisrael for Poshit, saving my life. Every tefillah, tilim, learning, or Reisman to so many of my Yedidim. So that would have been a good thing for me to talk about, relatively easy. Chinuch, I was the head of the Vada Chinuch in Minneapolis, of the Torah Academy, of the Beis Yaakov. I taught seven years in the Masift of Cleveland. Building a kehila? Minneapolis, Erat What a Beis Yaakov, what a yeshiva, with a lake with Koilo. People in Minneapolis are incredible. I would think I'm a shoo for that. Tears in the fabric. I didn't really know what the issue was. Let me tell you. Agudas Yisrael, based, Agudas Yisrael, the national Aguda, is always cutting edge. Shuvu, the legendary Shuvu, was launched from the Aguda Convention. The preservation of Harazesim that I'm heavily involved in launched from the Aguda Convention. This is cutting edge. Most of the island doesn't even realize what we're talking about. 
of Pesiata Deshmaya, Dr. Blumenthal, myself, will educate you and hopefully inspire you to inspire others. There's a lady in my kilo, very messy divorce, a hush of a lady. She's in shul before me. And she told me last week that her daughter is getting married. Gepucked and gemuzzled, she raised this girl. The daughter hasn't spoken to her mother for three years. She's not only not invited to the wedding, she doesn't know what a wedding is. She doesn't know the day of the wedding. And she tried to get it out of the system. I'm not allowed to tell you, or I can't go to the wedding. Shimrei Shamayim, what's going on? How terrible could this mother be? That's the terror reaction. We throw the terror out the window. Out the door. It's a mitzvah. And I'm here to say, honestly, there are misguided rabbis and therapists who enable and empower youngsters to destroy the family life. I know of a case in Lakewood. Wonderful young man. They just got married. They were having issues with the mother-in-law. Roshiva said, don't go to the Seder. Don't go to the Seder. Are people so weak and the relationship so weak, so tenuous? It's an amachane. When I was in Minneapolis, there was a saintly doctor by the name of Dr. Harold Wexler. Chaim Anashat Tzadik. His license plate was Tzadik. He was a Tzadik. He was the best diagnostician in the Twin Cities. When he became a doctor, he couldn't find a residency. There was such anti-Semitism in Minneapolis. Couldn't join AAA, couldn't join the country club. They started Mount Sinai Hospital so that the Jewish doctors would have residencies. Unbelievable man. It wasn't Shem Terimitz, he's a great doctor. And his daughter is having connection with Lubavitch. And she became from. And she influenced her parents, her brother, big time at Chachem today. And everything was great. She got married. A nice fellow, friendly with them. At a certain point in time, he decided she could have nothing to do with her parents. Rabbi said, Savainan, I was at a simcha in Minneapolis, and there in the social hall was Dr. and Mrs. Wexler, and the next table were their children and grandchildren, not allowed to speak to them. I'm not blaming anybody. But we have to encourage people. I don't know what the background was. But eight o'clock? Should be raised in the Torah Academy around the block from their parents, grandparents' home and not go visit them? <laughs> Dive in a different shul because you can't look at them? What's happened to us? We've gone awry. I have a, a barber. His name is Alex. He's a big tzaddik. He grew up. Russia area, non from, came here, became Shemitara Mitzvahs. He came to my son's chasna in the lake where I danced with him in the middle. I was at his son of Lazar's bris. So I mentioned to him that I'll be talking about this at their Gura convention. He told me, Rabbi, you have to tell people there's a Torah and you're not allowed to be jealous of anything or anyone except for the Torah. I see him in action with the kids in Flatbush. They come and he says, why are you doing this to your mother? Why don't you get a haircut like she likes? Why are you using that phone? You know she doesn't like it. Your mother loves you. The Baba is giving Musser. Every one of us, we see something awry in a nice way. Your mother loves you. Your mother loves you. Your mother loves you. Your mother loves you. I'm not saying there aren't terrible circumstances, parents alienating their kids. But is that the terrible response? That there should be one mishpoch in cloud Yisrael? That they don't talk to each other? Based on Gemara Zok, that's a klola. The klola of the nachash. Oyla lagag mizanei sev imay. Yoyred lamata mizanei sev imay. Zok the Gemara. The nachash is cursed eternally. He goes to the roof, he's got his food source. Goes to the cellar, everything is the food source for the nachash. Where's the klola? He has whatever he needs. That's the klola, he has whatever he needs. 
The Ben Shalom says, Ainli Asikimcha. I want nothing to do with you. You're not going to come on to me. There's no communication. That's the worst klala. Gemara says you don't talk to somebody for three days and you're able to talk to them. You're a sine. You know what a sine is? You come to my bezin and you kill Bishayig as a sine, we'd say you did it amazing. Not talking for three days. Scream at them, but talk to them. Children can't lose faith in their parents, and the parents can't lose faith in their children. It's not my way, the highway. I have a hush of a daughter, she's Sadekis. She's a rabbi in Kiat Safe, her husband has a Gewaldig Kyle. By the way, Alex's barbershop is on Coney Island Avenue. Between uh, now he moved to open his own shop, I and J. He's a Geschmack Yid. Go to a guy who sends his kids to Yeshiva Flatbush. Go to a guy that takes care of people. You know what he told me today? His biggest dream is that his son should learn in Kolel and he'll support him. Vos Kolel, Ven Kolel, my Bob. So my daughter, Baruch Hashem, she looks very good, so she went to a diet class a while ago. And a lady gets up and she says, you know why I'm heavy? It's my mother's fault. Because she didn't let me eat what I wanted to. She restricted me. So Mamela, I went the other way. I binged, and that's why I'm overweight. Another lady, Choshev lady, gets up and says, you're right. It's also my mother's fault. She let me eat whatever I want. Why did she stop? You can't have it both ways. It's called the blame game. Dovin HaMelech. Shol HaMelech. Shol HaMelech. The Achaz ve Olsaloi. Dovid Amelech Bishtaim ve Loy Olsaloi. Both seem to do an Avera at a certain Madrega. Shol Amelech allowed Agog to live. He loses the Malucha. Dovid Amelech with the counting of Kal Yisrael on the inset with Bathsheba, he doesn't lose the Malucha. Why? His Avera was so less. Hey. Shol Amelech, Shtet Nenovi, Shmuel, Aleph, Tezvov, Nimlachti, I'm upset with Shoel. He allowed Agog to, be, to remain alive. For that came out Amolek and Hitler, Mach Shmuel de Tzores. I'm rescinding his monarchy. I'm canceling his malucha. So Shmuel Anovi is approaching the king. And you know, like in football, the best defense is a good offense. Hakim Oisiz Vashem, Boch Hashem, I did what Hashem wanted me to do. I brought Kobanis. Zokt. Shmuel. And you know, I never knew my father did this. He would get Parsha Zokh in his shul, and I was never there. And subconsciously, I must have absorbed my father's that sounds holo achilich. So in Minneapolis, for 90 years, I got Parsha Zokh. I'd say, Umeh. That's, that's the drop. What, what, what do you mean? What, what's that? If you did that, what's, what's all that bleeding? Oh, those are the kabbonis that we brought. So Shmuel Novi, does Hashem want you to be, bring kabbonis? Do the will of Hashem. You raised him in an arm, I was scared of the people. That's why Hashem made you a king? To be a chicken? He apologizes too late. The blame game. The nation. It's the Kabbanis. David HaMelech, Chotosi Lashem. He doesn't lose the monarchy. It's time for us to rise up and say, Chotosi Lashem. Whether the parents improper treatment of the kids, the kids disenfranchised for the parents, Chotosi Lashem. Think about it. Think about it. I'm going to a Levaya today. One boy is 10 years old. The son's 12 years old. The parents had a very messy divorce. But they worked together to raise these children. And one little boy, 13, is going to be saying Kaddish for his mother. And last night, when his father's second wife called me, she was crying copious tears over the patira 
of seemingly a nemesis who went to, to the lawyers and made life miserable. Listen, the mother's the mother. She had her malach. She's the daughter of a tzaddikis. It was very messy. They didn't allow it to permeate in the house. This kid, she asked me a shayla, can she hug the 13-year-old? She's crying. My wife and I, when the phone came back from Lakewood, it was incredulous. This is a Bas Yisrael. This is a Bas Torah. You could have someone who's driving you nuts, Nebuch, you know, a different approach, and you're crying over her Ptira. Are we crying? Are we doing the right deal? Ela told us, Avram, Hailidas Yitzchak, Yitzchak ben Avram, isn't it redundant? But Avram Avinu, the greatest thing, was that a child Yitzchak. And to Yitzchak Avinu, the greatest thing is that a father Avram. State that they have Yitzchak as Esav Kitzayid Befiv. This is such an incongruous statement. Yitzchak was an oil of Tamima. He never left Eretz Yisrael. So he loves Esav because he gives him prime rib rare, like the oil and likes in Flatbush and in Minneapolis. Special rub, special seasoning. Makes a steak and puts a merak bone on top of it, like Eli Vanitsky does. Hello, that's it? How could you say he loves him because he gives him meat? So shaykh is hot that's a flesh. Rabbi Sai, I'm telling you a very important message. There's a cutting edge session. This is going to start something that's going to save Klal Yisrael. The inner fabric is torn apart. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are suffering for this. We're going to all change it. That good convention is going to change it. Klal Yisrael is going to change it. Listen to this word. I'm putting this snacht in the wrong place. Yav Yitzhak as Esav. Ki doesn't mean a reason. It means a symptom. How do we know that Yitzhak loved Esav? Ki tzayid befiv. Because he always ate his meat. He found commonality with him. You got to find commonality with your children. With Yanki Vavina, was the Ktsais, the Nasibis, the Shmites, and the Pritzandik. With Esav, it was a shtick of flesh. Vayav Yitzhak as Esav, what's the Raya? Kitsai Befiv. I only eat your meat, and I'm always eating your meat. I love you. Find commonality. Kid likes to go bike riding, go bike riding, bowling, go bowling. Find commonality. The Halagi, Mos, and Klal Yisrael have been davening for the children. What are they davening for in Flatbush? What are they davening for in Minneapolis? What are they davening for in Muncie? What are they davening for in Barbara? What are they davening for in Williamsburg? They should be wealthy? No! They should be Tamine Chachomim. They should be Tzadikim. They should light up the world with Torah, copious tears. There's a Tfila, a Tchina that the Nashim Tzidkaniyas have been davening for. It's over 500 years old. It's based on Kabbalah. The Mutter Frank once explained Pshat in the Trina. It's something that the men never knew about. But then they made a beautiful song, and we all know it. Umeirem esawawoylom Batoirov amasim toivim let me ask you a question. The world of Aguda, the world of Lakewood, the world of Satma, the world of Vishnitz, the world of Aguda Shor Beis Binyamin, the world of Kilas Beis Yisrael Minneapolis, the world of Cleveland, and all the wonderful shuls, including a very Choshev shul, Headed by a guy of David Aaron Gross Schlitter. What do we push? Teire, 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 noch teire. In Beis Daniel, teire. In the Aguda, teire. In my shul, if you don't learn two, three hours a day, you're a loser. Went to Martin Abchaim every year I go to him this year, I didn't go to ask him what to tell the other before Yom Kippur or on Yom Kippur. He tells me different zachim once about Lulav. Then he asks me, I said, yeah. He says, how long? An hour? I said, no, two, three hours. Every place in Flatbush, every place in Muncie, nobody learns less than two, three hours. 
So what are we talking about? If the may of the world with Tyra, that's it. Now the one who authored this Tchina for the Jewish mothers to say saw the future of Hey Tov Shin Pei Aleph 2020. There are going to be some kids that don't have a Gishmak in Gemara in the 7th grade, in the 11th grade, in the base Medrash. They're bored out of their skulls. So that's it. It's all over. Pushtak. Bum. The mothers are davening that their children should be a kivei ger a moshe feinstein a moshe birnbaum the sat mereba avada umeirim es ha'olam batayra. But let's just say it doesn't work, and he's not connecting to the blood. Masim tovim. He can light up the night with masim tovim. He doesn't even have that. Bechol malechas avodas habayra. He's a member of chaverim. He lights up the night. We have to realize our children. He can light up the night with everything. What's the matter with us if you're going crazy? So some kid doesn't exactly finish in a mold. It's all over. You're embarrassed because he has his button open. You're embarrassed that we're hat. Don't be so embarrassed. Be proud of him. I know a kid. He doesn't exactly dress yeshivish. I was in his house last night. Shalachim Lakewood came to the door. Give bottles of water. Who thinks I'm in Shulach? This kid does. He's not learning 80 hours a day. He's not the big Lamdin. But he thinks out of the box. Give him Shulach. I'm not just a dollar, but a bottle of water that lights up the night. Our kids are incredible. Parents, I don't even know why I'm saying this. Kabbalah from Rabbi Shalom Chadron, if it flies into your brain, you say it. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your kids. Don't be disenfranchised. Don't be disappointed. Everybody wants the kid to be better than them. Give them opportunities. They don't want those opportunities. I was at a chasen last night of an Isha at Sadekis, who Nebuch was gone. She was gone. We thought we'd go to her Levaya. Isha Chashuv in Baltimore again, Svelte was davening, and I was Zoycha to be at that chasen to see the mother glowing. My nephew is one of my Minneapolis boys. And he like the ankle, totally yeshivish. All his brothers, this one finished Shas at 19, you know, one of those kind of families. He's a handsome boy, he's not yet married, and he has a nice head of hair. So I told him, listen, take it from me. It doesn't last forever. Enjoy it while you can. Says mother, oh, she must say, because, no, no, Rob, tell him to get a haircut. A Ribbitson says, you know, you can cut your hair a little bit. I said, absolutely not. Your hair is shorter than mine was in Chaim Berlin. And the Ribbitson says, uh, at different times, I don't care. But the bottom line is a good kid. And I told him, I don't care what uniform they're wearing. Ease up on your hair. Trust me, it doesn't last forever. There's so much that Rabbonim can do. We can encourage people. We know the horror stories that can go on for 50 minutes, all about the horror stories. But what do you do? Be like the Baba Alex. Encourage, inspire, encourage, inspire. A neighbor in Shul, an uncle and aunt, a Bubby and Zadie, to do what nobody else can do. Very painful. Most painful thing for a parent. They're not monsters. Khalil a molester, I got it. They didn't see the same thing. They insulted them. The mother-in-law, please, let's enable them to be powerful. Let's enable them to get out of the blame game. Let's enable them to realize there's a burialum. And your atzlacha comes to Rebbeinu Shalom. And if you take care of your parents, your kids are going to take care of you. Was that a chasana? Terrible rift in the family. And they hadn't spoken for years. My shviga knows this family from 50 years ago. It was the nicest family in Flatbush. The grandfather learned my shver zatzal, my saintly shver of my daughter, Chavrusa, for many years. A tzaddik. The mother, a tzaddikis. Mamish. It's all tzaddikis. Vegan. Gelt. 
and unfortunately, huge machlekes in the family. We're not talking to each other. And it was a chasana, and I give credit to, to, to the son. He made sure the father was there, but he didn't give him a bracha. He didn't give his grandfather a bracha. So the parents are very insulted. I got it. I understand it. But try, 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 try. What if the Rebbein Hashem thinks when we're mavata, 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 be mavata? The Rebbein told me a maise. With a Rav Agayin, Rav Avram Yoyne, Scheinberg. You're not going to believe this story. It was Shashiva in the Veyakov. And he made a chance at the beginning of Corona. And he did everything possible to follow the guidelines. The kids are, they had the police come and visit, they checked everything out, and they were satisfied. An hour later, another group of police come, they shut down the wedding, they're about to arrest the Hassan Kala, they take a Ramyoyna and his Rebbitzin to the police station. Somebody had made a phone call. Somebody had made a phone call that it's an illegal gathering. I know Rav Yoyna, he's exotic, he's a Talmud Chochem. He wasn't fighting with the police. Took him to the police station. The kids, uh, the Chosan Akal with Sebrachim, beautiful wedding, meticulously planned, as you know. All the guidelines, all the expense. She was crying. Father said, it's all in Hashemayim. Now as Paul Harvey said, listen to the rest of the story. About three months later, a few weeks ago, Rabbi Mjernig gets a phone call. He says, I'm the bacha that called the police. I was misguided. I just thought it was dangerous for the people there. I never intended to destroy the wedding. He's crying copious, copious, copious tears. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm from Yeshiva Bach. Rabbi Mjernig says, I'm a you. But you got to be macabre to learn five minutes of Musa every day. But you got to talk to the chassan and kawa. I, I, I can't do the full machila. So he makes an appointment. He sees the chassan and kawa. He's crying. He's begging for forgiveness. Very hot. Very hot. This kid destroyed their wedding. She's my home. Two days later, she was involved in a horrific three-car accident. A few weeks ago. She's pregnant. They needed the jaws of life to extricate her. Baby's okay. She didn't get a scratch. Father said, you know what happened? There was a gazera against you not to live. And Avernsham decided that he's going to take it out on your wedding. And when you were Mavata, you got it all. I'm begging, I'm begging, begging. Those that are estranged, and have every right to be estranged, those that have mole tainus. I went to this chasana, mole tainus, had his father. Do it for yourself. Don't do it for your parents. Do it for the Torah, do you sure? Somebody asked me, what's the solution? It's there, it's the Torah. You think every one of us had cozy relationships with our parents and never any tainus? Mole tainus. But Rabbi Sai, please, I beg you, those that have an issue, those that can solve the issue, let's be Klal Yisrael. Let's do what we always do. Let's encourage youngsters Enable them to be strong and not to have the blame game. Feel their pain. Don't dissolve it as if it doesn't exist. Im Cain, Im Kol Zeh. Let's follow the footsteps of our We know thousands of stories of people who Mavata and the Shuyas they had. Do it L'Shem Shemayim. Do it for the Rabbi He looks down at us and he sees this tremendous achdas, you know, of one of my lawyers, Danish List House, he's a very prominent Ben who happens to be a lawyer, and he's a senior partner in a law firm. So he really had the COVID very bad. Chesed Eli, and he's okay. 
and he tried opening his law firm. Problem was, the lawyers didn't want to go. The clerks didn't want to come. The secretaries didn't want to show up. They were terrified. He had to coax them and beg them to come back to work and pay us. They can't keep us out of shul. They can't keep us out of the base medrash. All kinds of xerus against us, and we're bursting to get back into shul. To do it b'seicheldik, with the masks, make a kiddush Hashem. Chazle Hashem. I've got the, uh, what's it called? The, uh, you know, if you have the corona, what do you get? Antibody. Shashkoyach Moshe. Moshe is not just the Talmud Chochem, makes a great cup of coffee, hazelnut, akuponim. So I have the antibodies. So I don't got to wear a mask. I walk in the street, a mask. Shabbos, a mask. What are the going have to say anything about us? You know, Rav Reisman's position, Rav Brody, myself. Bottom line is, let's make a Kiddush Hashem. And let's bring Klai Yisrael up. And this signature event is going to be cutting edge. It's going to start an awareness, not just to say, Oshamnu Bagadnu, but to do something about it. To validate the people that are hurting and to help them. And their schos will be zoyche to doyrish yishor meverochim yirotzen. Will be zoyche to toyre vigdula b'mokim echot. Will be zoyche to shiduchim, 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 sholom b'ayi simcha sachayim. And the greatest simcha b'viyas ha'goyl b'mheira v'yameinu. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Rabbi Leaf, for your warm words of inspiration, encouragement, chizik. Still catching my breath. Our next presenter is Dr. Norman Blumenthal. Dr. Blumenthal is the Director of Crisis and Trauma Intervention at OHEL. He's someone who is there for our community. Unfortunately, anytime there's a tragedy, trauma, Dr. Blumenthal is the number one resource that we have in our Kahila. He's someone who gives of his time with humility, with compassion, and with tremendous knowledge and wisdom. His bio could go on for about 10 minutes, but it's not even worth losing a minute of Dr. Blumenthal's time. So without further ado, it's an honor to introduce Dr. Norman Blumenthal. Good evening, and uh, I would like to personally thank Agudat Israel for giving me the opportunity to give us this talk that's so important, and specifically Rabbi Becker, for all the arrangements that he made, and of course the technical staff, which we cannot forget, who actually traveled, uh, in this in my instance, to my home, and uh, has really put in all that effort to make this work. Uh, it's also very both humbling and a great honor to share the podium, albeit virtual, with Rabbi Leaf, who is such a central figure, such an important rabbinic figure in our community and always knows how to bring in the timeless lessons of Chazal to the relevant issues that we're dealing with today. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today in terms of parental and grandparent alienation is not a situation where there's tension necessarily between children, parents, between grown-up children and their older parents, where there's going to be a strained relationship, where maybe there isn't as much contact as one would expect or like because of certain complications. That's not our topic today. The topic today, we're, what we're talking about is, as the, it says, is alienation, where there is an effort and all too often successful effort to completely sever ties between a child and a parent, or between a grandchild and a grandparent. A terribly tragic situation, and one that uh, I have to admit is among the most painful, as I will elaborate later, uh, of all the types of suffering that I, as a mental health professional, have to deal with. I will have to admit that I have somewhat of a bias. Uh, most of my work in the area of parental alienation is in high-conflict divorces, which is an area of my, uh, that I have an expertise in. So I come across parental alienation much more in those contexts. I have had some exposure to uh, alienation that takes place outside of a divorce situation, which I will address. Uh, but uh, my bias, if you will, or my, my experience is much, much, very much weighted in the area of divorce. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to explain first what parental and grandparent alienation is. Uh, 
What's the psychological mechanism behind it? How does it happen that otherwise sensible, intact people could come to believe such horrible things about people and such erroneous facts about parents and grandparents? It's damage. What does it do? Um, how can you tell the difference between maybe an accurate report of some terrible behavior on the part of a, a parent or a grandparent and when it is this type of parental alienation? Uh, what are the different types, as I alluded to before, what can be done? And on those rare instances, which again needs to be discussed, where a severing of ties may actually be necessary, necessary for someone's mental health or even for somebody's physical safety and so that we can make those kind of differentiations. I have here a definition of parental alienation, which I've sort of culled together from a number of definitions, which I think captures it best in terms of my understanding. And it's as follows, parental alienation paradigm is a deliberate and pernicious pattern of behaviors aimed at distancing one parent or fostering disdain for that parent or both parents. The often unstated goal is to sever ties with the alienated parent or parents through persistent degradation and brainwashing. And it is literally brainwashing, as I alluded to earlier. In, in the situations that I deal with, which are mostly divorce, you have an otherwise intact child whether it's an elementary school age child, adolescent, etc., who will believe and will loudly proclaim, if you will, um, horrible things about the alienated parent, terrible uh, accusations that are not based in the truth and are even would seem completely distant, far-fetched from the truth, and yet believe it or seem to believe it and try to it can appear very convincing. And how, how does that happen? How does one alter one's mind in such ways? Um, and again, the accusations that I'll sometimes hear from children about parents is that they, they beat them, that they molest them, that they're, they're serving them unkosher food, uh, all sorts of horrible things that are so remote from what their parent would do, and yet the child seems to believe it and almost seems convinced of it. It's, it's sort of like they're in that sort of in-between state, which I will clarify briefly. So how, how, do, how does that happen? How, do, how does that occur? So first of all, just to give you a sense of its frequency, according to Clower and Rivlin, Clower and Rivlin are a psychologist lawyer team that wrote one of the key or one of the really important books on this subject, it's called Children Held Hostage, and they combine their expertise as an attorney and a mental health professional. They identify parental alienation in divorce in 80% of divorces. Now that has to be taken with a huge grain of salt. In other words, in 20% of divorces, according to this study, there is never, one parent is never bad-mouthed, uh, or a parent does not bad-mouth the other parent in both ways. Now, you know, they're including Maybe once every two, three weeks if the, uh, the custody payment, if the support payment is a little late and the parent kind of rolls their eyes and say, how come your father or mother can't get the check here in time or every once in a while shows some disgruntlement with the other parent. And, and I don't think that's really damaging to the child. They take it in stride. It's in, almost inevitable. There's usually very intense emotions when a uh, divorce takes place, when the person who is supposed to be your best friend and your closest confidant turns into an adversary. So there's going to be some of that. That doesn't harm children. And I think the type of parental alienation, even according to their statistics, because they break it up into how often negative remarks are made, once a week, you know, twice a week, or something like that, really falls closer to somewhere between 20 to 30 percent. So in, let's say, a fifth to a third of divorces, there is this type of parental alienation taking place. And again, I just want to remind you that I'm focusing now on divorce, but parental alienation can occur outside of divorce. So what you have in, let's say, one out of five or one out of three divorces situations where a child comes to believe these horrible calumnies about the other parent. Now, the, as I said before, these are not psychotic children. There's not children that typically uh, digress from reality or distort reality. So how, do, how does it happen that someone's grasp of reality, that someone's understanding of what's really taking place could be so altered? So to understand that, we have to, for a moment, identify priorities, particularly for children, but even to some extent for adults as well. Usually, we think what a child wants is happiness. A child wants to be happy, a child wants to play, a child wants to laugh, adults too. 
that we really want to be content and happy. And that's true. That is a priority. But there's a bigger priority than this kind of personal happiness, and that's safety. We want to be safe. If we have a choice, even as adults, between pleasure and enjoyment or being secure and safe, we're going to pick being secure or safe. I can go to the biggest chocoholic among the audience and present them with this delicious uh, cake full of cream with my, my father all used to call Schmierkuchen, you know, full of chocolate and everything, chocolate chips and the finest Belgian chocolate. And tell them, by the way, there's poison in it. I doubt they're going to eat it. They're going to forgo the pleasure for safety. And this is particularly true of children who are little people in a big, dangerous world and therefore going to seek out safety before happiness. Now, if we are in a high-conflict divorce, and imagine that one parent in essence says to the child, if not in words, through his or her actions, I'm going to love you no matter what. Whatever you do, whatever you say, I might be disappointed in you, I might be angry in you, at you, but my commitment to you, my commitment to you as a protective figure is not going to alter no matter what you do or say, which is how most of us feel about our children. But what if in a divorce situation one parent gives this message, this sort of blanket, uh, um, not approval, but blanket uh, assertion, a blanket assurance of their affection and their presence as a protective figure. And the other parent says, you want me to be this protective figure? You want me to be this loving figure? You have to believe this, that, or the other thing. If you don't embrace this belief that I'm conveying to you, then I'm not available to you as a parent. And that's in implicitly the message given by the alienating parent in a divorce situation. So again, one parent is saying, no matter what, I love you. I may be upset with you, but I love you and I'm there for you. And the other parent says, no, my love and my protective presence is dependent upon your believing this, that, or the other thing, the child is going to take on those beliefs because that assures him the presence of both parents. Because now he has the parent who gives him the complete blanket assurance and also has the parent who conveys and imparts the conditional uh, assurance of their affection and presence. And therefore the child then will embrace the conditions and will say, okay, I'm going to believe what you say. They don't think this out consciously. This is, the, this is sort of the, the root. This is what is at the base of all brainwashing, is that the brainwasher exploits the victim's need for safety and security. For example, uh, many of the in POWs, uh, prisoners of war, especially from North Korean prisoner of war camps, who came back brainwashed, believing horrible things about the United States of America, who needed extensive debriefing. It was the same basic principle that it was operative, because the oppressors, the, the camp commanders said, believe this, espouse and embrace this, this belief, and you'll eat, you'll survive. Or similarly, some of you may, of us may be familiar with, it's a very rare occurrence, but it's an interesting one, the Stockholm Syndrome, where somebody is taken hostage and become, comes to embrace, most famous is Patty Hearst, uh, comes to embrace the ideology of the hostage takers. It's a similar mechanism, because that person's survival is dependent upon that other person, and that other person may, may give over the message, or usually gives over the message, that your survival will be assured if you embrace this ideology. They will literally alter their brain and believe something that is not true. And so therefore we have situations, uh, again, particularly in divorce situations and high conflict divorce situations where there's a lot of bitterness and a lot of subsequent to, from the divorce uh, fighting, etc., that children will come to believe, as I said, almost unthinkable types of situations. I, I've had situations where children believe that the alienated parent will poison them, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't eat their food. These kind of outlandish beliefs that, again, that in no other situation do we see that, uh, that kind of tendency in them. Now, I guess it doesn't take a stretch of imagination to realize how damaging this is, but there's probably the most damaging part may not be evident. One obviously damaging part is if the alienator is successful and the alienator alienates that parent, or again, if we take it out of the divorce situation, alienates that, that grandparent, or again, parental alienation even when there isn't a divorce, um, we were, Hashem made us to be raised by two parents. 
but not only just raised. Unfortunately, Nebuch, there are situations where there are there is only one parent because of death or illness or mental illness or something like that. But uh, but I, even just to have a connection to that parent, an, an orphan child, Lo Elenu, can still feel a connection to the deceased parent, and that not only the connection, the, the affection from both parents not only is absent here, and not, not only is the, the, the unique contribution of mothering and fathering uh, the, taken away from the child, but the connection to their ancestry. And that's not something to minimize. Uh, there's a lot of fascinating research now that shows that people's awareness of their ancestry, their connection to their ancestry, even knowing about grandparents, great-grandparents, etc., makes them more resilient. People who have an awareness of who their grandparents and great-grandparents were. I know the, the narratives, I'm not going to go into that, it could be a whole topic unto itself, of their family and where they came from, have a sense of belonging and don't feel so disconnected and therefore are stronger and ha able to handle stress better. And of course, there's some staggering statistics. How many, in America at least, how few people know all of their, even grandparents, forget about great-grandparents. So they're deprived of that because the alienation very rarely takes place just with the parent, the alienation takes place with grandparents, with extended relatives, with just a whole sense of belonging with that part of the family. But there's another very important type of damage that's done. And by the way, I'll have to say that this kind of parental alienation accounts for most of the children from divorced homes that do have lingering damage and harm. The, parent, the children whose parents get divorced, whose parents are able to have a civil relationship, are able to work in conjunction with one another to parent the child, even if they don't have much affection for one another, those children tend to be okay. It's the ones who are thrown in the, in the crossfire of this kind of conflict or who are subject to parental alienation, the ones who are damaged. And the way it's damaged is, now again, let's put ourselves in the shoes of this child who is who's subject to parental alienation. They are being, in a way, coerced to believe things about the parent that doesn't fit with their actual perceptions. Doesn't, act, doesn't fit with their actual experience about that parent. So they lose that capacity to trust their sort of intuitive sense, their capacity to accurately perceive what's going on. Because they're looking at this mother or looking at this father and see a basically decent person with no more faults than anyone else. And I'm being forced to believe that this person is a criminal is a horrible, horrible person, so it doesn't coincide with their natural perceptions. So they grow up as adults who can't trust their instincts, can't trust their intuitive sense of others, can't trust their perception of others. Now, if we would all stop and think, something we almost take for granted, but if we would stop and think how much we rely, how much we depend upon our ability to just trust our instincts, in, in relationships, in getting married, in, in business, in friendships, that, we, that that intuitive sense of here's somebody I can trust, here's somebody I can't trust, here's somebody likable, here's somebody not likable, here's somebody potentially dangerous, but they, they lose that capacity and it affects the general functioning. So this extremely, it's a very damaging to the child and these will often grow up to be adults who cannot rely on that sixth sense that so much of so many of us do in life and are therefore extremely limited and harmed in their capacity to function. So it's very damaging. It's almost it's it's like a you know worse than even a physical damage because it messes their mind. It messes up their capacity to read others and connect to others. And therefore those are very often the ones whose functioning are very compromised. Now it's interesting because there is a difference between the from community and the general community when we're talking about parental alienation. Um, there are many differences, in fact. You know, very often in many areas of psychology, even if there's greater frequency, less frequency in our community, uh, our community tends to follow the patterns of the general community. But in divorce, our situation is very different. Um, for example, and this is not related, but in, in uh, the general community, well, marriage is very unpopular, very few people are getting married, but those who do, the younger marriages seem to be more stable. The, the rates of divorces that are increasing tend to be among the middle-aged, even older population. In our community, we're having much more of early marriage 
divorces. So there, there are differences. But one of the interesting differences is that in the general community, most of the parental alienation and divorce takes place with the custodial or residential parent, usually the mother, alienating the non-custodial or the non-residential parent, usually the father, in a way, in a wish to sort of just get rid of him and very often successfully because it becomes such a battle. It becomes such a battle just to get the kid to come for a visit. And when the kid's at the visit, he's calling 911 and he's calling the mother and screaming about different things the father's doing that are just not actually happening, then many fathers just sort of throw in the towel. Terribly painful. But interestingly enough, in our community, it's the other way around, that we're seeing much more of the father and usually non-custodial parent alienating the mother. Uh, my belief is that the reason why that, that is the case is because we place such an emphasis on being the head of a household, raising a family, that when one is deprived of that opportunity, it just sort of hurts too much. So you have the father very often alienating the mother or the non-custodial parent um, alienating the, the custodial residential parent. Now, there is a change here taking place, which is that more and more, many more states uh, are mandating, and if they're not mandating, many courts are embracing this the notion of having equal custody, if you will, even in terms of time spent together. Two weeks in the father's house, two weeks in the mother's house. The original motive for this was to reduce uh, litigation. Uh, I have to admit that when this first started happening, I had my doubts about it, but it seems to be working. Now, it gets complicated when one or both remarry, but it is, so with that happening, we may see a reduction as well in parental alienation. I don't know if that's the case yet or not, but I could see where that might happen. Now, by the way, also, parental alienation are grounds to take away visitation or custody or to mandate supervised visitation. However, it's hard to prove, and unfortunately, many even judges and attorneys don't really understand or fully appreciate parental alienation, and therefore, it's, even though it may be uh, warranted, it's often not, to enfor not enforced. Now, how do you tell the difference between parental alienation and an actual legitimate gripe? And there are telltale signs. I have to tell you that I recently wrote a report uh, for Besden, and I identified parental alienation, and I listed the criteria and to show how this fit the criteria. And one of the Dayanim pointed out to me that now the alienating parent knows what not to do. So I'm not going to fall into that trap again. I think you had a good point. But just to give you a sense that it's usually, very often you feel that the complaints are very scripted. Usually the, the child is complaining uh, uh, embraces a certainty that's not warranted. It's a little bit like the Gemara in, in Sanhedrin that says when the entire Besden wants, uh, votes in favor of um, execution, you don't execute the person. Nothing could be that certain. Where they, without your even asking, tell you how they came up with this themselves. There are many, you can, if you discern the complaints, you can tell them. And I have to say that in situations, and albeit rare when a child needs to sever ties with a parent, we'll talk about it in a minute, it's usually much more painful. It's, 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 they're, they're much more conflicted. And here they're just so certain. So they're, they're, but there are ways to tell, and if you can't tell yourself, and part of the purpose of this is to, make it, to bring it to people's awareness, uh, there are professionals who are trained to make that difference, and they, they should be the ones who should do it. Um, okay, now, in the situation of grandparent alienation, or parental alienation, outside of a divorce situation. Um, I don't, I generally think, I'm not sure if somebody brings statistics, because I hear I'm a little more shaky ground, that I, I can be proven wrong, but I usually don't think it's as vengeful as it is in a, in a divorce where there's such intense emotions. And usually the motive behind it is more to be controlling or sometimes even just to make their lives uncomplicated. And by the way, there is statistics to show that many people who engage in, in these forms of alienation were, were, grew up with it and grew up in homes where alienation was part of, of their family life, etc. Um, but usually these are people that are very overbearing, controlling, or look for easy way outs. And by the way, also people who in other circumstances as well will sever ties if they have a falling out with the rabbi. They, they will suddenly, they're the, they're the switch shul type of people or with a neighbor that they won't even talk or acknowledge that person. That kind of, that becomes, it becomes a general sort of uh, lifestyle. Now, it's also damaging and it still it does tamper with the children's perception, especially if they, let's say if it's grandparent alienation, if they had a relationship with that grandparent, 
data connection with that grandparent, and now they're being told how horrible the person is. So again, you have that same uh, messing with their mind. Um, and it, the only time that you don't have that is if the child is born into an alienated home and therefore have never had the contact with the grandparents, but still it's very confusing to them. And I've had situations like that where they were asking about grandparents and felt, or they're told that they're dead and then they find out that they're alive. And so there is that mind uh, manipulation as well going on there. That's harmful. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there is still that severing with the ancestry and the connection. So it is a terrible thing to do harmful to the child, maybe slightly less intense than the divorce situations, but still just, just also harmful. Now, as I mentioned, um, there are situations when children cannot be connected with parents. There are, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're not immune to the ills of society, and there are parents who are abusive, who are sexually abusive, physically abusive, and there may be parents who, for various types of mental illness, are doing harmful things to children. Remember, sometimes when I remember the time when I was very involved with placing children in the high school. We had a program in our neighborhood to make sure every child had a high school to go to. And sometimes we came across children who needed to get away from their parents, not severing ties necessarily, but it was harmful for them to be in the home. We used to talk about it as a parentectomy. They needed to go out of town. They needed an alternative. Look, El Hill, where, which I represent and uh, I'm, you know, uh, and that I work for and I run the trauma team for, has a foster program. For, for kids from Shama Shabbos homes where they need to be taken away from parents. But even uh, adults, sometimes connections with the parents open up such scars and open up such wounds that it's, it, it's harmful for them to be in their vicinity, in their presence. That, that can happen. And in fact, it can happen the other way around also. Sometimes, and this is almost unthinkable, but sometimes parents have to suffer ties with the child. A child who may be violent, a child who may be stealing from them, a child who may be doing them uh, unbearable harm, they may have to sever ties. So it, it can happen, and I don't want to come across and say that every single time there's a, a break between a parent and a child or a, a, a grandparent and a grandchild, it's because of, of this type of alienation, but we have to consider the possibility. And you have to make that discernment and not just necessarily in a knee-jerk kind of way uh, jump to, to, uh, to one conclusion or the other. Uh, and as I said before, if you can't uh, allow the professional to make that decision. Now, can you fix parental alienation? It's very hard. And one of the things we try to do is sometimes encourage the children to think for themselves. That's the approach that I often take. Is to, and and I, can, I can't do that with a young child, but I can do it with a teenager. Tell them that, just think for yourself. Don't listen. And even, let's say, even it's a situation where, the, again, we'll say in the from community where the father is alienating the mother, to say to the child, you know what, whether, and I talk about both of them, whether it's your mother, your father, when divorce situations, sometimes you have to come to your own conclusion. I can't say I have resounding success. Um, Broken Ties, which is an, a new organization in our community that is trying to deal with this issue of parental and grandparent alienation, has, you know, and spearheaded, by the way, this, I be, you know, believe, was significantly important, or something important in spearheading this talk, um, says that they have at their disposal therapists who have some impressive success in what's often referred to as reconciliation or reunification therapy in families. Um, I haven't personally. I, I hope they're right. I haven't seen such success. Again, I'm working much more in the area of divorce where maybe it is more intense and embedded. Um, and other situations, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes the motivation to alienate grandparents is just to try to simplify their, their life. It's not the right approach. And we know when it comes to relationships, the more you have, the more you get. But if it's, let's say, it's someone who's widowed and remarried and they just don't need six sets of in-laws or eight sets of in-laws and it's complicated and sometimes then I think it's easy to prevail upon them that it's actually enriching to to preserve all those relationships but again Broken Ties says they have therapists who are, have a lot of success and I really hope they're right and that would be a resource to go to to fix these sev the severing of ties. Um, I want to conclude by just saying what I can't say in words which is how unbearably painful it is to the grandparent and to the parent who's alienated from their children or their grandchildren. I just don't have the words for it. 
I think the reference point for me, and maybe with this I'll conclude, you should try to conclude on a positive note. This may be a more painful note to end, but this stuff is so painful that maybe we have to do it that way. But I often think about the famous Rashi uh, in a Parsha we're going to be reading soon, uh, in, in, when, when in Parsha's Vayeshev, when Yaakov is led to believe that Yosef is dead, and uh, the, 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 uh, the, his children, his family, try to give him Nechama, and the Torah says, Vayimainlis Nachem. He refused to be comforted. And Rashi says there, Nachama can only work if the person, Rahman Salan, is dead. But if the person is alive, but you're separated from that person, there's not even that magic called Nachama. There isn't that refua that Hashem gives us called Nachama. And for the alienated parent and for the alienated grandparent, they are in Yosef's shoes. They are, they are also severed ties from the child, but the child is alive. And you can't even have that nechama you could have. Again, I'm not saying it's not painful when a child dies. I, mean, I deal with this all the time, but, but there's at least that uh, divinely uh, bestowed nechama consolation that's given. But you can't have that when the child is alive. So they live in that sort of ne that, that netherland of being somewhere between having lost the child, but the child's still there and that never can really achieve that nechama. And it's certainly my hope that through these efforts and the effort of go to Israel, and of course I think I was remiss in not thanking Ohel, who gives me the chance to do, give these kind of talks, but through all the efforts of these great organizations, the conclusion of this scourge that we're discussing today should be the same conclusion that took place between Yosef and Yaakov with a, a, a miraculous reunification and, a, and an opportunity for families to be whole again. Thank you for the listening, and I hope this has been helpful.